Life Christian Broadcasting Network presents The Bible. God's Voice of Prophecy with Jack Berg. Good morning. My name is Jack Berg. I am the pastor at Sun Valley Baptist Temple. We're located at 9901 McCombs in Northeast El Paso. We also have a Christian school that is with the church. It is called Northeast Christian Academy, better known usually as NECA. And uh, it uh, has students from K-12 all the way down to K-3. So we have a broad variety. We have a good number of students and a beautiful campus. If you'd like more information on it, you can call uh, 915-755-1155, and they'll be glad to give you everything that you need. And, of course, we're on the website. We have a f Facebook page and all the normal uh, things that you'd look for. So if information is needed, just uh, look those up, and we'll be glad to give you that information. I'm married to Josie. Josie is... Uh, Busy today taking care of her two grandkids who are in school uh, online, but uh, dad's unable to take care of them, so Josie's doing that, which is a good, uh, good deal for a, a grandma. I'd like to talk about and continue with something that we were looking at last time. It's called the Day of the Lord in the 70th week of Daniel. I think here we see some things that open up some prophecy to us if they're handled well and handled rightly, most importantly. They open up a great deal of prophecy and they give us some warnings that need to be there. There are three beliefs that uh, go along with the, the uh, uh, scriptures. And there's a belief that says that the 70th week of Daniel, which is a seven year period that's prophesied in Daniel. I don't have time to get into the explanation of it. Even though it's called a week, it's actually uh, a week of years. So it's seven years long. It is started by a peace treaty between Israel and someone else. And that should ring a bell with you as we look at what's going on around us today with peace treaties being made between Israel and several other nations. And on the slide, it does show a good handshake here along with the dragon which is there, which is, of course, Satan. Satan is given in scripture as the, uh, as the devil, but he's portrayed as a dragon. But in there, after that peace treaty is signed, and that peace treaty has to have with it either under construction a temple to, for the Jews in Israel or already completed temple for the Jews in Israel. There are a couple of things that need to, to go on. Thessalonians tells us, that number one, the man of apostasy has to be there. And that man of apostasy leads in an apostasy for the church. I think it affects and looks like it affects every nation on earth in some way, fashion, or form. That white horse represents the Antichrist. Scripture tells us in Revelation that it's a man who is mounted on a horse who has a bow what it doesn't say, he doesn't have any arrows. Now, let me just say to you that what I'm telling you and what I'm saying to you has been, was believed for the first 400, of the, 400 years of the church. Up until the year 400, this was the accepted doctrine. Even though we're 2,000 years away, the scriptures are the same. They're read the same. They have to be interpreted the same. And this was the belief. And so that 70 weeks, that second horse that's opened up in the book of Revelations is wars. And then the black horse, which represents also wars and pestilence. And finally, the fourth horse, which comes up with out of fourth horse out of seven, which comes up with plagues. We might look at that from a standpoint of today, but certainly that's not the plague that it's talking about here. This is the plagues that are associated with death. These are with wars and with death that come. I think the thing is, that's really important here is to understand. There are some people, and I can't, don't have a pointer here, so I can't illustrate it except to say that this handshake right here 
Some there are many who will say that they're pre-tribulation. And they believe the rapture occurs at that handshake or that rapture occurs somewhere before the beginning of the 70th week. Now, the first part of it's called the beginning of sorrows. You can see this and compare it in Revelation chapter 6 and in Matthew chapter 24. And the, the similarities are so great. The chronology that's given there in both those books is so great. It has to tell us and indicate to us they're the same. One of them is given by Matthew, and of course the other is given by, by uh, John as a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so if those two are that similar, then the events and so forth in it that are portrayed have to be very accurate. But with pre-tribulation, the belief is, you know, is very sincere that at this point here in front, there'll be rapture in all of this period. Now there's more to this period than what we're showing here. But all of this period is a time of God's wrath. However, there's a group that believe that everything occurs or that the church is raptured. Now, the rapture is we want to, you know, people say it does not mention in Scripture, but the word for it is used, the Greek word for it is used several times. And it just means simply that the gathering together of, of the people of God with Christ himself. There's a group that believes this happens at the very end of the seven year period. And I put the pointer, that pointer down here at the very end of it to indicate that's where they believe it. There is a group though called pre-wrath. We're not new, not at all. This is the belief of the early church or the early church either tended to believe it was, would fall right in this area or at the very tail end of this. But let's continue and just open up some more of this, and I think that will help you to see. The first four horses represent the Antichrist and all the things that he will bring. He's going to bring wars and famine and pestilence. I think that's why, you know, repeatedly the Lord says, watch, prepare yourself, be aware of it. He uses it in different ways. And the early church really looked at the Roman government, looked at Nero and said, that's the Antichrist. And certainly... I can understand where they would believe that to be true. But what wasn't true was the man who would lead the apostasy and the apostasy or rebellion against God had incurred. The man wasn't here. The other thing that's necessary is in the end of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, says Elijah the prophet will return. Now I believe and many agree with me that out of the two, there's two witnesses that are listed in Revelation. And those two witnesses, I believe to be Elijah and Enoch. And these are two men who have never died. They do die here. They are, they are killed after their, their, pro, their time is, is up. They prophesy for three and a half years. I frankly think, and one reason I've left it up, that they do their, pro, their, their uh, work within that first four seals in the beginning of the period of the seven year period. That would make it very effective and give the nations who are going to reject them and kill them at the midpoint would say to them, there's no excuse. You know the truth. You've heard the truth. I cannot help but think what it must would be like to have maybe, maybe a CNN will uh, uh, give uh, an interview to Elijah or to Enoch. And I think the world will look and say, it's crazy. It's crazy. But what they're going to tell the world is, Christ is returning and there's a period and a time of wrath. I know we have a couple of hurricanes in the Gulf today. This has been one of the busiest hurricane season in history. We have the fires on the West Coast. We've had minor earthquakes that have done some damage. We have the COVID, what we call pandemic or, or plague, which is in America. And boy, sometimes it just seems like, you know, it's all falling apart. I have people who have been terrified with fear over the COVID. The churches have been closed. Now we're open. We are totally open. We're holding Sunday schools. We're holding uh, the 11 o'clock service and we're holding a Wednesday night service as well as a Sunday night service. Yeah, we're still to still filming those or videoing those, those services and putting it online. 
but at the same time, we're open and you're invited to be there. And if you, you know, if you are looking, again, it's Sun Valley Baptist Church and you can find it in, on your website. But I think what's most important here is to understand when those two witnesses come, when all the warnings that, that are given in scripture about this day, called the day of the Lord, we should realize what God is doing is warning us. He is saying, be prepared. Now you and I, and I know we have a lot of people who are, are preppers, who believe there's a, a, an end that's coming to this world and we're preparing for it. You know, the reality of it is where you need to be prepared is your relationship with Christ. That's the most important relationship you have. Because regardless of what happens in this time period, and there's things prophesied, especially uh, later on, but there's things that are prophesied here that are going to be devastating, much more devastating than what we've seen so far. Death can come at any day. Death can come at any time. Death can come at any age. And sometimes we forget that. But the reality of it is, all of those that are going to die need to have their relationship with Christ firm. Do they know who he is? Is he their Lord and Savior? Have they accepted him? Do they confess him with their mouth? In other words, are they open with their faith? And I'm not saying we need to go, go uh, as some might say, that we need to go uh, to um, every neighbor and everybody that we're with and everything should, you know, should be preached. And I think there's a time coming when that will become more important. But you know what? At this time, we need to be winning people to Christ. We need to be talking to them about Christ. As you go down in the 70th week of Daniel, and it's also called, uh, part of it's called the day of the Lord. Well, what we have in the middle of it, and Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, he quotes the book of Daniel. And he says, there's an abomination of desolation who's gonna come and sit in that temple in Jerusalem. I've been in Jerusalem, I don't know how many times. I have been to Israel 20 times. So I, you know, I can set and picture that in my mind to see that, that temple there. I know that today we have people who say it has to go in the exact spot where the mosque is. I think there's some trade-offs. The people of Israel are very tired. And there are people who say that the, that the temple didn't sit there, it's set instead by the city of David. But however it's done and however we reach this, be well aware that this, this third temple, as it's called, is not a dedicated temple to God. It's really a defiled temple. It's one that's built with compromise. It's one that perhaps won't even have most of the sacrifices to it. There are a lot of people, who, Jewish people and rabbis, who say that there should be no sacrifices. Be that as it may, the thing to remember is that temple is there and there's a place inside of there called the Holy of Holies. Up to the time of Jeremiah, inside of there was the Ark of the Covenant. And that Ark suddenly disappeared. I believe that Ark is in heaven. And they're not gonna find that Ark underneath the temple. That uh, Temple Mount has been um, dug out by the Crusaders by the Byzantine Empire that was there in Jerusalem for over a hundred and some odd years uh, by the Muslims. It has, it's a continuing process that's been done. And it's not that it's not been found or located, but the Holy of Holies is still the Holy of Holies. It's a place the high priest can go, only go once a year. And he goes to that to give a sacrifice or an offering that's given to God for the atonement of sin of the nation of Israel. But instead, what the Antichrist will do, he's going to enter that Holy of Holies and he's going to sit there and proclaim himself as the living God. He is the Christ who's returned. I will tell you in the modern, uh, in the uh, Muslim religion, there is a Jesus Christ who comes. He comes with what's called the Mahdi. Only he comes to destroy Christianity. And in fact, it says he'll make his home in Israel for, or in Jerusalem for seven years. The, the uh, coincidence is, is more than just a uh, passing coincidence. 
But what occurs here is, I think, at this point, the scripture says the abomination of desolation sets off a different period. It begins to come into the second three and a half years. Now, this seven-year period is split evenly, 1,260 days on each side of it. It's very exact time. After he arrives, you can begin to count. Uh, I mean, after the Antichrist is, is in position, you can begin to count the days. You can know exactly what's going to happen from Scripture. The abomination of desolation sets off the, uh, what we call the fifth seal. I should have said that those stars, the one, two, three, and four, the stars here represent seals that are wrapped on an ancient scroll. If you take a look on Wikipedia, there's even a picture of that. And it's one that, uh, a, a scroll that was found with the seals still intact. On each of those seals will be the insignia of the person who has sealed that document for his purposes. This particular case, of course, the seals have fallen apart over the years. It goes back to the time of Christ. However, none, and nonetheless, this represents, and here these seals represent each one of the things that is going to happen in that seven-year period. So he's taken these seals, and it's Christ who's breaking them and opening them. Make most, no mistake about it. It is Christ who's opening them and things that are beginning to occur. As you begin to look at it, there's what's called the Great Tribulation Period, and it's only a short period. And what's most amazing there is when you take a look at it, in all honesty, it's a period that is not a, a tribulation period like it's been said. It's a tribulation period by Satan as he attacks Christians and believing Jews and tries to exterminate us completely. You know, if you've watched lately, and we even talked about it this morning on a couple of radio programs, and if you listen to them, they, they many people understand that we are at a position in a time where this looks like it's really, you know, coming to pass. I think it's Satan's wrath, not God's wrath, Satan's wrath directed at Christians and Jews. Because of that, the fifth seal opens up, and there's martyrs which are found upon underneath the altar of God. Now, again, you can look at Revelation 6 and read this or Matthew 24. But these martyrs are found underneath the, uh, the altar of God. They're in protection. They've died during this great tribulation period. They're given, they're given robes of righteousness. Now, the problem here is they're given the robes. What do they do with them? Because it just simply says it's the souls of the martyrs. So apparently the martyrs somehow keep these robes and they wait on them. What's fascinating is, is that when you look, this tribulation period starts and on the sixth seal, all of a sudden God begins to intervene and there's earthquakes. There are things that begin to happen that are beyond our understanding, I think, for, uh, to kind of detail out much of it because it's so serious and in Revelation chapter 6, make sure I can find it here. And I beheld one at verse number 12, Revelation 6, 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. You know, the picture that are drawn here is a, a world that's being destroyed by the wrath of God. He's cleansing it. And you would think as this occurs, people would turn to God. But as we continue reading, it says, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Until the wrath of God begins, Christians can be here. What we are guaranteed in Scripture is we will be saved from wrath. This is the start of that wrath. 
And you're going to find in Revelation chapter seven, we are in heaven. And those souls that were under the altar now are wearing those white robes because they have the new bodies. They're guaranteed. Verse 17 finishes it by saying, for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Pre-tribulation is saying that I, that we escape before this seven year period starts. It's good theology and it's certainly comforting. The problem with it is Daniel chapter seven, Daniel chapter two and in Revelation, it says the antichrist will fight against us. We will fight him and we will lose. And Christians, the elect, will be, uh, will be uh, in submission to him. That's a terrible thought when I think about it, but nonetheless, it's what it says. And because of that, because it's something that's going to happen and the wrath of God's going to start, we are raptured at that point. And a lot of people will say, but pastor, he comes as a day of thief in the night. You know what? You're right. What it says is we cannot know the day or the hour, but I can know the seasons. I can know the seasons. I'll, I'll bet there's hardly a person out here who's not looked at the, at the uh, f virus that we have, the fires we have, the problems in the Middle East. You know, that's where all this is going to take place. Is around, it revolves around the nation of Israel. And with everything that's going on, it says to us quite clearly, it is that time. And we should be looking up. We should be preparing to, to go through a terrible period. The tribulation period is then cut short. It is cut off. You know, I have to stop here, but I hope that maybe in here that you can take some the time to take a look at scripture. You know what? And not just look at it, but study it and make sure that your relationship with Christ is good. Have you asked him to be your Lord and Savior? Have you asked him to forgive you for your sins? And if you have, do you feel certain? Is there a draw to do what is a, a right according to Scripture? Is there a new, mind, a new mindset that you have for Scripture and for what's going on around us? I know we've covered an awful lot today, and I hope that we have more time to go into it and begin to make it, uh, be able to break it down more and read the Scriptures. But it's so important that you make sure that you are, um, that your relationship with Christ is true. This is what we picture today is terrible. It's a terrible time. And because of that terrible time, we have no, uh, nothing that we can do except to make sure our relationship is correct. You know, with that, what I'm saying about that is there's, I should be a time in my life when I can remember that Jesus Christ has dealt with me. It's not just a matter of being born into this religion, into Christianity. It's a matter of a time and place where I can say, I literally had a meeting with Christ. I know people who get saved at five years of age. Some of them get saved at 80. I had a man who got saved when he was 84 years old. And he went from being a man who was very uh, violent and, and very uh, short-tempered to being one of the most gentle men that you can possibly see. He didn't live long enough to really enjoy that because he died a couple of years later. But during that time, he tried, uh, he tried to make himself into something which was different. And he didn't have to do that because Christ gives us a new mind. In Ephesians chapter two, it says, by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It's given to us as a gift from Christ. If Christ is giving you that gift and you know that you're a Christian, then I hope that you'll take a look at what we're looking at and say, Jesus, give me wisdom, give me direction so that I can live as I should. These verses continue on into ch chapter seven of Revelation and what's most fascinating, and there's some people here that we're gonna skip for a minute. We'll come back to them. <clears> the <throat> 144,000 that are sealed with Christ. But all of a sudden, in verse 11, it says, all the angels stood round about the throne of God and about the elders and the four beasts and they fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, amen. 
blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and front and, uh, uh, and um, honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence come they? And I'm sure John was greatly puzzled. And he says to the angel, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, there are they which came out of great tribulation. And again, great tribulation in a short period. And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him night, day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall head lead them into living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You know, for the saved at this point when we're raptured, everything that we've known uh, is and all the things that we've perhaps occurred to is because of our faith. Not the things that we pray, but the things that we've done or her occurred to us because of our faith, all of a sudden, all that is meaningless because of what we receive. You know, if you're looking for a rapture, here's the point for the rapture. It, I, this is certainly the point for the rapture it has taken place. Now we're in heaven. Now we're in a place that's safe and secure. I hope and I pray once again that you stop and give these things some thought because at this point, the day of the Lord starts and the day of the Lord is where we will pick up on the next session. But the day of the Lord is the time and place that we don't want to be here. It's the time of God's wrath now. It's a time when Satan is destroyed. It's a time when we are out of it. We are kept safe from the wrath of God. And may I say to you again, I hope and pray that you'll do some study. Daniel, I mean, uh, Revelation chapter 6, Matthew chapter 24, the book of Daniel 9, the book of Daniel in chapter 2 and chapter 7 are all very prophetic. The book of Zechariah, that's the second to the last book in the Old Testament. Take a look, do some study, and be able to have a footing to your uh, life in Christ. Thank you for being with us this morning.